Hey friends, I'm Jeffy G. Welcome back to the channel. Last week was big news for Native Instruments. They released their new Control S series MIDI controllers and there was a lot of excitement about it. It seemed like everyone in the business got a free one. But this video is not so much a review because there's lots of great videos out there that cover the features and capabilities of that new MIDI controller. What I want to talk about is what's really going on at Native Instruments and how that stacks up against the competition. Let's take a look. Now it's important to know that I'm not sponsored by Native Instruments or any other vendor, so these opinions are strictly my own. If you find this information interesting, consider clicking on like and the subscribe button. I'd really appreciate it. Now the first point is, are the new Native Instruments Control S-Series keyboards the best in the business? Well, that's debatable. They're not the most innovative. There are other companies that have passed Native Instruments in terms of innovation. But I will admit, I was previously considering the previous flagship controller from Native Instruments for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's integration with Complete Control and the Machine 2 software. If you're a Native Instruments user, you realize that having those encoders and the display pre-mapped for all the Native Instruments software is a huge benefit. I do have a Control M32 and I like it a lot. I use it with my mobile rig. And they had lowered the price of the Mark II keyboard, which was a good indicator that something new was on the horizon. But to summarize the features that everybody else has been reviewing, it really comes down to just a few things. The number one new feature is the polyphonic aftertouch. Number two, is the display itself. It's a bigger, brighter, beautiful display. Above the display, number three, are these group buttons. And not all the NKS instruments that you get in complete take advantage of those yet, but all of those synths and virtual instruments are being redone to take advantage of that display. Now the keyboard itself is still the Fatar style keybed which is excellent. It's top quality. I would say those things are the main pluses. Now there are some questionable areas. First, it's not MPE compatible, where a lot of other MIDI controllers have gone the route of supporting MPE. At this point, Native Instruments has not. Another thing that seems to be missing is support for the Machine 2 software. Now that could be coming in a future release, but at the moment, if you're a Machine 2 user, you've still got to use a machine device or another MIDI controller to take advantage of it. Now DAW integration might be very important to you and it's always been well supported. But just keep in mind that this MIDI controller is very much a keyboard player's, is very much a composer's tool that focuses on keys. There are no pads and there are no faders built into this keyboard. If you want those capabilities, you either have to buy those devices separately or you got to look at a different vendor like Aturia or Novation or somebody else. Native Instruments has cleverly built some of the features that you would get in another keyboard into the display. For example, if you want to do fader control, you can use the encoders to increase or decrease the volume, or they can be assigned to do panning. What they've decided is those eight encoders can have multiple uses depending on what process you're going through. When you're in the mixing phase, they act like fader controls and pan controls, and they can be assigned to do different things. But when you're in browser mode, they are used to browse through the available presets and instruments that come in complete control. And then once you've selected an instrument, they take on device specific roles, whether it's controlling macros, which you can have many of, or things like arpeggiators and chord controls and some of the typical features you'd find in any other MIDI controller. But their strategy is to use a minimum number of hardware devices, whereas some of the other vendors like Arturia, Novation, and M-Audio, they tend to put all of the hardware on the surface of the MIDI controller so it looks like a control surface device. Now as far as DAW integration, Native Instruments has always been pretty good at supporting all the major DAWs. So this is going to work great with Logic and Ableton Live and Studio One and Cubase and FL Studio. You don't have to worry there. But let's say you're an Ableton user. You may find that some of the other vendors that have the pads built right into the device integrate more smoothly with Ableton. They look the same, they support the same colors, and if you're into that 
looping style of composition, you may find something like the Novation launch key is better suited to the way you do your composition work. Now there's going to be people who just love native instruments and for them this is going to be an obvious upgrade. Now for a lot of people who haven't made that commitment to native instruments, who aren't particularly embedded with complete control or the machine software, there's a bigger topic to discuss and that's what's the best MIDI controller for the type of work and workflow that you do. So if I was starting from nothing and I had a list of features I'm looking for in my next purchase of a MIDI controller, would I buy the Native Instruments Control S series? Now it's a little more expensive than some of the budget brands, so I would have to take a look at Arteria, M-Audio, and Novation, and a few others before I make that decision. You might find that those other keyboards are better suited to your workflow. However, if you are an occasional user or a regular user of instruments from Native Instruments that you access through complete control, the new S series is going to give you the tightest level of integration, and that may improve your workflow. So let's talk about the strategy behind Native Instruments. They would love to have you buy more than one device. They would like you to buy one of their new S series keyboards. They'd also like you to buy a machine device and if you're into the whole DJ thing, they do sell a tractor, a new tractor device that works very well with their software. So their strategy is very much specific to the nature of the music work that you're doing. If you're a beat maker in hip hop and a composer that uses a lot of loops and you want to take advantage of all the expansions that they offer, the machine device might be your best way of going about that. If you're a keyboard player that primarily composes on a keyboard, they're trying to support you with that keyboard orientation. High quality keybed, transport controls, encoders, and a display that integrate with their software. Archuria kind of does the same thing in that they have software that delivers more than 30 of their virtual instruments that are highly regarded. And if you use one of their keyboards, it comes tightly integrated with their software. But if you take a close look, you'll see that it still has pads, faders, and encoders on it that could be mapped and used with complete control. So I think Native Instruments is targeting specific audiences here. The keyboard player, the beat maker, the DJ. Now, another very interesting trend where Native Instruments is a leader is their NKS standard for tagging presets in synth. If you have a variety of virtual synths from different vendors, one of the things you've probably noticed is that they all have a different browser for looking through and organizing presets. So if you have Vital or Serum, for instance, it has its own browser, its own method of navigating through the presets. If you have SynthMaster 2 or one of the SynthMaster products, they also have their own browser with thousands of presets. So one of the dilemmas as a composer is that if every vendor has their own standard for navigating through presets, how do you find everything if you've got multiple products from multiple vendors? Native Instruments is trying to address that with this NKS standard. The idea here is to get all of their partners to comply with a tagging method that will work across all products. And some vendors like Yuhi and Arteria are complying with that NKS standard. And if you open up complete control, not only do you have access to native instruments, synths, and virtual instruments, but you also have access to Archeria instruments and Yuhi instruments. And there are other vendors that are partners as well. Now it remains to be seen whether that NKS standard will dominate the industry, or is it limited to just a certain number of players? And it's kind of like MIDI. MIDI is a standard across the board, and we expect all vendors to comply. The interesting thing is, when you look into the sampling world, there is a standard that crosses all vendors, a way to tag samples that is consistent no matter where you get those samples. It'll have the BPM and the pitch and tagging information for the genre and style of those samples that is consistent. And that's great because you can download samples from almost any provider 
and you can load them into a common browser. I like to use the ADSR sample manager, which is free. I think whenever there is a standard that comes from one vendor, there's always this concern <laughs> that it's a bit of a monopoly and that innovation might be limited by that one vendor. They can only move so quickly. Another serious consideration is how you plan to use the Control S series keyboard. It really is ideal for studio use or as a composer. It's not really designed for live. In my case, I do use a MIDI controller for live with main stage when I go out to play a gig. I have all my presets in main stage. Sometimes they combine multiple third party instruments and logic instruments that are layered and I organize the keyboard so I can play multiple sounds from one keyboard. And to meet that need, I might take a 61 key keyboard, or in some cases, I take a Roland A33, which is an older style MIDI controller, but it has 76 keys. So there's lots of room to play different sounds. The Native Instruments Control S series is not really designed for live. It could be used for live, and that display would be quite useful. It's easy to see. You could organize your presets in advance, but you would probably have to use complete control. And complete control is not quite designed to skip from preset to preset in an organized way. Whereas in main stage, I can have a group of presets for a specific song or a specific set, and they'll be in the order that I plan to perform. Will Native Instruments go down that road of supporting the live environment? Well, they might. With the machine device, you can do live looping, and some people are taking that to a live gig, some DJs are using it. And they do have their tractor device, which is designed specifically for DJ purposes. It's interesting to think, what would they have to do to make the Control S series more useful for live? One concept is that it now has a processor built into it, like a computer. And Native Instruments has done this before with the Machine Plus, which doesn't require you to take a laptop computer or a separate CPU with you. You can do everything from that one device. Is it possible that future keyboards from Native Instruments will have sounds built into them that you don't have to hook up to complete control? If you look at the effort that's gone into managing that display on the device, you can imagine it wouldn't take too much more to just build complete control directly into that keyboard add kind of audio capabilities, quasi audio interface like they've done with the Machine Plus, and build that into the keyboard as a premium device. I mentioned at the top of this that Native Instruments doesn't do leading edge. There are other MIDI controllers out there like the Osmos and the Roly keyboards that really push the limits of how expressive you can be on a keyboard. But those technologies are new and expensive, and it's questionable as to whether the broader market is going to adopt those things. For someone who wants those capabilities, they'll pay the price for an Osmos keyboard. But I think Native Instruments realizes that there's kind of a barrier for a lot of us, and that might be $1,000. We see a premium keyboard as costing around $1,000, and we look at budget keyboards costing anywhere from two to $300. When you get above $1,000, there has to be something very unique and special about that MIDI controller. In that regard, I think Native Instruments has done a good job of pricing the new Control S series keyboards, very similar to what they've done before in their flagship products. They're obviously hoping for broad adoption. And I think those new keyboards are gonna be really good in about a year or two when all of the software catches up to the capabilities of the hardware. Heaven knows they must have given away hundreds of these keyboards when you look at all the YouTube coverage and hype. So to summarize, am I gonna rush right out and buy a Native Instruments Control S series keyboard? Probably not. I'm gonna to continue to work with the keyboards that I have, and I'm gonna keep a close eye on what some of the competition does to respond. Will they include MPE support? Will there be new features that integrate better with certain DAWs? These are important to me. But at the same time, I do recognize that the Native Instruments Control S series will probably be very successful. It's a premium MIDI controller at a high but still reasonable price. And that's a good business strategy. I've done other videos on MIDI controllers, and they're some of my most popular videos. 
There are links to those in the description, so feel free to view those. It might help you make your pie decision. And if you have comments that you'd like to share about the topics in this video, please do. I appreciate comments. If you like what I have to say, click on the like button. Consider subscribing to the channel and click the notification bell if you're interested in when I release new videos. Thanks for watching.